Good morning. It is great to see each of you in the house of the Lord. Those that are in the sanctuary, great to see you. Those that are joining us in the fellowship hall, great to see you as well. And those that are joining online, we apologize for the audio issues earlier. Hopefully we've got that all uh, taken care of and you can follow along, not just seeing stuff on the screen, but also listening as well. Uh, I've enjoyed this series, Dark Horses, and I, I hope you have as well. We've got today and then next Sunday to finish up. And then we're going to be starting a new series after that, just a short mini-series called You Asked For It. And uh, those of you that are joining in person, you should have found a card as you came in. And love for you to have it. Go ahead and uh, write in your question. If you have a question about God, question about the Bible, or a question about what the Bible has to say about a modern uh, event or something going on in culture, we'd love to be able to answer those questions. Maybe something like, how can we know the Bible is true? Why does God allow bad things to happen? Or can you be a Christian and fill in the blank, okay? Um, and there's already been some great questions turned in. Uh, I've taken a look at some of those and uh, starting to think a little bit of how we might package some of them together. Some of them have kind of common themes, and so we'll look to address those uh, together in many ways. But love to have your questions presented, and if we don't have enough time uh, to, to cover those in a couple weeks, I will look to cover them like through the news sheet or some other way. Uh, but just want to make sure that your questions are answered and know that sometimes we have questions that are kind of awkward to ask. And so we've just provided a way where either in person or online, you can submit those anonymously. And so I have no clue. I mean, sometimes I can tell maybe who wrote something or once in a while, somebody will leave me actually their name. Like last week, somebody left one in there and I'm going to go ahead and answer this one because their question was, what's a dark horse? Like, that's a good question. It came from one of our elementary students who happened to have a birthday last week. He signed it. So, um, so what is a dark horse? A dark horse is someone that's previously less known that emerges to prominence. Okay, so they, not a whole lot is known about them. They're not really popular. And then all of a sudden, they do something that catches a lot of people's attention. Or somebody that you would not expect them at all to be able to do what they end up doing. And it, it comes from horse racing, where there's not a whole lot known about the horse, and all of a sudden, they, you know, they're in the race, and like, okay, this one's a dark horse. We don't know what to expect. We, we haven't really been able to get a lot of information on them and, and stuff, so, so we don't know what to expect from them. We, we know these two horses are really good. We expect them to win one of these two. This one we don't know a whole lot about, so we don't know. They could win. We don't know. But uh, So we've looked at it both ways. Sometimes our dark horse that we've looked at is somebody that really is more obscure in Scripture and haven't heard too much about them before. Um, not necessarily one that pastors tend to preach on. And then there's other ones that, like I preached on last week, who pretty much everybody, even if you didn't grow up in the church, even if you never attended church in your life, you've probably heard about David and Goliath, right? But yet, David was one that was least expected. I mean, he wasn't even supposed to be out at, uh, out at war. Uh, wouldn't have been the one that people would have chosen to go fight Goliath. They would have chosen one of his brothers or King Saul, who was really tall and he was supposed to be the leader. You know, like somebody that would have had more experience and somebody that was bigger, somebody that was well, more well known in that time to go fight Goliath. Today we're going to talk about Josiah, King Josiah. His story is found in a couple different places in Scripture. It's found in 2 Kings chapter 22, and then he's also found in 2 Chronicles chapter 34 and following. And so we're going to reference both of those sections, uh, 2 Kings 22 and 23, and then 2 Chronicles 34 and 35. Now, before we get into talking about Josiah today, I think it would be helpful to give a little bit of background on King Josiah and 
kind of the history leading up to his reign as king of Judah. So in the beginning of Israel, having kings, so back earlier in the series, we looked at some judges, and now we're looking at a couple kings. David ended up becoming king, and we looked at his story a little bit last week, and then King Josiah. So I'll kind of connect some of those dots. So Israel's united. They have the 12 tribes of Israel, and they are one kingdom, and they want a king. And so God says, okay, I'm going to give you a king, and Saul is anointed the first king of Israel. He starts off doing okay, and then he gets sideways with God. And God then anoints David to be king, and David leads the nation of Israel, and there is tension, there's turmoil. Um, if you have more than one child at home, you know that there are times when siblings, even though they love each other, they don't always get along. Is that true? You think of having 12 of them, and some of you have blended families, and sometimes that works really well, and sometimes that is a significant challenge. Well, favorites and all of this and dad likes you more, or mama, you know, my mom is better than your mom. And you have this with the nation of Israel going on with the 12 tribes. And as they grew and grew and the tribe of Benjamin, they kind of wanted to do their own thing. And David works really hard to have a unified kingdom. Well, King Solomon ends up taking the reign after King David and uh, David's son Solomon, wisest man on earth. And you would have thought that the wisest man on earth would have had a, a great rule and reign. And in many ways he did, but he also made some, some missteps along the way. He made quite a few missteps along the way. And the, the book of Ecclesiastes is uh, a little bit about those missteps. So at the end of King Solomon's reign, they end up dividing. The nation is divided around 930 BC. And so we have what is still called the nation of Israel, and it's just the 10 northern tribes. And then we also have the southern kingdom, which is called Judah, and it's the two southern tribes. Okay. So in 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Kings begins uh, talking about David's reign and, and goes through that and, and then into Solomon's reign and then falls into the rest of the different kings of Israel and Judah. Uh, First Chronicles starts actually going back to Adam and Eve and then kind of just uh, pulls that out into David's reign and so forth. And then Second Chronicles talks about basically the rule and reign of the, the kings of the divided kingdom. Now, what's interesting, as you go through these, we see that the nation of Israel comes to an end at about 722 BC. And as you look at the nation of Israel, the 10 northern tribes, you see this common theme. And it really began at the split with Jeroboam and Rehoboam. And with the king of Israel takes over... <laughs> The ten tribes, right from the very beginning, he doesn't seek the Lord. He's not seeking to follow the Lord. And so as we go through 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, and many of those, because they're covering the same time periods, they'll overlap and they'll talk about King this and King that, the same ones. And a lot of them will have the same things. Sometimes Kings gives a little bit more detail than Chronicles, and then there's times when Chronicles will give a little bit more detail than what is given in First or Second Kings. But as we follow the nation of Israel, the, the northern kingdom, we see that king after king after king did not serve the Lord. That the nation of Israel did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord. And that God ended up getting to a point where he was fed up with them. And he allowed them to be conquered. And they came to an end. On the contrary, Judah had a decent start. It was, but it was mixed. Their first king, sometimes he did good, sometimes he did not so good. But as you follow their kings 
<laughs> you see not really a pattern necessarily where you can go two good kings, one bad king, or two, good, two bad kings, one good king, or three, then one. But you would see this pattern time and time again where there's just one phrase that's given as, given as a summary. There might be more detail given about each king, but there would be a summary. One king may get two pages of, of type and, and another king a paragraph, but each one would get a summary sentence. And it would say this, essentially, and so-and-so did what was good in the eyes of the Lord, or it would say, and so-and-so did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord. How would you like your life to be summarized in one sentence? And Len Wyatt did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord, or Len Wyatt did what was good in the eyes of the Lord. Like one sentence to summarize your whole life. Did you please the Lord or not please the Lord? Well, we come to King Josiah, who could be Judah's greatest king. Let's check out his story. We're going to take a look. I'm going to read uh, beginning from 2 Chronicles chapter 34, verse 1. Josiah was eight years old. Any eight-year-olds in the house this morning? I know we've got two of them because they just had a birthday last Sunday. So Josiah was eight years old when he became king. I'm, I'm not going to put them on the spot and ask them, what would they do if they became king? Or in our context, what would you do if you were president of the United States? Like, free Skittles for everyone. You know, I don't know what it would be. But eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. So it begins basically giving, uh, giving a summary of King Josiah's life in his reign. Okay, So he was eight years old when he became king. He reigned for 31 years and a summary of his life in his reign. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the left or to, to the right or to the left. Now, I want us to see that there's, there's four different lies that Josiah is going to, going to shatter, okay? Lie number one is your past determines your future. Your past determines your future. Now, why is this a lie, and how does Josiah help us to see that this is a lie? Well, if you go back to the previous chapters before 2 Chronicles chapter 34, if you look at like 2 Chronicles chapter 33, you see it talk about his grandpa and his father. His grandpa was King Manasseh. And King Manasseh was nasty. King Manasseh was bad. When it gives the one sum sentence summary, it does not say, and King Manasseh did what was good in the eyes of the Lord. It said, and King Manasseh did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord. King Manasseh, if you look at chapter 33, it describes a little bit about him. He built... I, uh, altars and uh, to the to the Baals to false gods he built Asherah poles he he brought in pagan worship to the temple of the Lord items that were used for pagan worship he brought them into the temple of the Lord we also see in chapter 33 that he had at least one of his own sons offered as a sacrifice to a false god. He, he was horrible. And God ended up humbling him. And he repented, and he did turn and tried to do some good things at the end of his reign. But yet the summary of his 50 some years of reigning Judah was that he did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord. Well, after him came his son, King Amon. And King Amon gets about this much in scripture. And he too is said to have done what was evil in the eyes of the Lord. And then it says he did in fact, even he was even worse than his father. His, his reign was very short-lived. I think there were some people that saw that he was so evil, they, they wanted to do away with him, so he was killed. But then others didn't like them killing him because 
They liked the king. They didn't see anything wrong with the king. Like, this was normal to them. The way the society was going, the way the culture was going was evil. And so they were happy to have an evil king. And then we have King Josiah, who becomes king at eight years old and does what is good in the eyes of the Lord. And yet I think we have this lie in society, and sometimes I think even those of us in the church, we end up buying the lie, and we start making excuses for ourselves. Well, I, I can't help it because my dad was an alcoholic. My grandfather was an alcoholic, and so I, I'm going to be an alcoholic. Or... This has always been a part of my life. I can't do anything about it. Now, I want to say a couple things. First of all, I'm not diminishing the fact that there can be a, a natural proclivity to being addicted to something, particularly alcohol. That that can be passed down through the genes that you have a, <laughs> A tendency, you're more likely, if you have alcoholism in the family, that you're more likely to become an alcoholic. I, I, I get that. But I also understand God's word. That my past doesn't determine my future, the cross does. That would have been a great point for an amen, but that's okay. You guys will wake up as we go and and maybe you'll kind of figure it out. But your, your past determines your future. That's the lie that our enemy wants us to believe. Your past determines your future. And so if you've got a messed up past, if your parents were messed up, or just you've messed up in, your, in the past, that that determines your future, that it's locked in, you're, you're, you're done, game over, there's no hope for you. But as we look at the story of Josiah, we see that that is not true. Your past does not determine your future. As we keep reading, in the eighth year of his reign, so he was eight years old when he became king. He's reigned now eight years, so in his eighth year, eighth year as, as king. So how old is he now? Eight plus eight is 16. Any 16-year-olds in the house today? I think we have some that are like 17, right? maybe 18. I don't think we have any 16-year-olds, but close, okay? 16-year-olds, and now, how many of you, there are many that are, some that are younger than 16, and then there, there's some that are older than 16. I won't say, like, how much older, but how many of you remember when you were 16? Those of you that are past the age of 16, how many of you remember when you were 16, and some of you are going, man, you're really putting us to the test. First, you, you made us go 8 plus 8, now you're asking, like, do I remember when I was 16? Okay, 16 years old, you remember what you were thinking? Like driver's license, tests, girls, maybe work. Think about ruling a, a country making a difference, right? At the age of 16. While he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father, David. Then in the 12th year, he began to purify Judah and Jerusalem, destroying all the pagan shrines, the Asherah poles, and the carved idols and cast images. So he's 16 when he begins to seek the Lord. He's 20 when he starts to make drastic changes to the landscape of his country, of his people. Things that they were used to, things that they, that it was a normal part of their life to worship the Baals, to worship false idols, images made in the likeness of man or animals or whatever, to anything that they could think of, to the stars and the moon. They were big into astrology and, and uh, psychics and all of that. That was something that Manasseh had really brought into their culture adopted from the other cultures around them, like Egypt and so forth. And yet he knows that God wants them to do something different, that they need to get rid of all of that. And so he starts this sweeping change, which leads us to the second lie that I think is prevalent in our society. Young people can't make a difference for God. 
Young people can't make a difference for God. This is definitely a lie that our culture tells us. Too often, I think we buy society's lie by basically saying, well, kids will be kids or teens will be teens. And by that, it's the assumption that teens just can't help themselves. For instance, of course they're going to be sexually active. That's what teens do. Of course they're going to experiment with drugs and alcohol. That's what teenagers do. Young people can't make a difference for God. They're not going to be different, so they're not going to make a difference. Kids do what kids do. Teens do what teens do. Or as Josiah became a 20-year-old and he's making changes in his country, but we would look at it, well, 20-year-olds, college students will do what college students do, right? They party, they goof around, they sleep around, they do all this. That's what they do. We don't expect anything different because we bought society's lie. Josiah helps us to see that that's exactly what it is. It's, it's a lie. One of the things that would irritate me, not like shopping cart irritate me, not being put back in the shopping cart corral, but, but would irritate me over the years is when I would hear somebody say, well, you know, I'm so glad that you're working with teens because they're the church of tomorrow. And I understand the sentiment in that they, they see that it's important that we have ministry for those that are not adults because someday they will be adults and they'll be the ones making the decisions for the church and serving in the different leadership roles of the church and, and so forth and all that. But what would, what would bother me is they were failing to understand that young people aren't the church of tomorrow, they're the church of today. Yes, they are the, hopefully the church of tomorrow, but, but if they're going to be the church of tomorrow, like we want them to be the church of tomorrow, at least like I want them to be the church of tomorrow, then we better understand that they're also the church of today. That young people have something to offer the kingdom of God. That young people can, in fact, make a difference for God. That, that's what I have believed for almost 30 years of ministry and, and just working with teens while I was in college and so forth, that, that young people can make a difference for God and to have higher expectations. Now, I wouldn't have such expectations of them that I expected more out of my teenagers than I did out of adults. Like, I know they're still human, and I know that there are certain parts of the brain that haven't developed, and so there are some decision-making that, that can be a little bit more limited, but, but I knew that they could still make a difference for God. And part of that came from my understanding of Scripture. Part of it also came from my understanding of history. As I look at Scripture, I see, like, King Josiah making a difference for the Lord. I also see somebody like, King David, who we looked at last week, who most likely was a teenager, maybe 15 or 16 years old, when he went out to fight Goliath. I also look at Mary, the mother of Jesus, who God specifically tapped on the shoulder and said, I want you to carry my child, when she was very likely somewhere around the age of 15 as well. I think of Daniel. And the three cool amigos, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And how very likely they were teenagers when they were taken into captivity. And yet they took a stand for the Lord. I think of the different revivals after Scripture was written. Like the Great Awakening. Or the Great Welch Revival. And know the importance that teens or young people had in those. I think of King Jeremiah, or not King Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, who God called him to speak, and he was actually a, a contemporary of King Josiah. And he said, well, I, I can't, Lord. I'm, I'm a youth. 
And here's God's reply to him. Do not say, I am a youth, for you shall go to all whom I send you. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. I also think of 1 Timothy 4.12. When Paul writes to Timothy and says, Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in faith, in love, and in purity. I'm gonna, actually, I got ahead of myself. I thought I had another slide there. I, I want to read um, a quote, a couple quotes from uh, the, the Great Awakening. Jonathan Edwards wrote, The revival has been chiefly amongst the young. Okay? Well, you think of revivals, and most of them, they start with teens or college students. In 1859, during the Great Welch Revival, one witness reported one of the most striking characteristics of the movement was its effect on young people and even on children. The youth of our congregations are nearly all the subjects of deep religious impressions. Catch us. Very young people, children from 10 to 14 years of age, gather together to hold prayer meetings and pray very fervently. In many places, the young people hold a prayer meeting of their own, and these sometimes proved instrumental in bringing the powerful influences of the revival to that particular locality. The majority of all converts of the revival were young people. And yet, we have this lie that seems to kind of go through the church even, that the young people can't make a difference for God. That they're going to do what kids do what kids do. Teens do what teens do. College students do what college students do. In other words, they're going to mess up. They're going to make mistakes because that's just what they do. They can't make a difference for God. You can't trust them spiritually. You can't trust them to do anything in the faith. And I say baloney. Baloney. So teenagers, elementary students, don't buy the lie. God can do great things through you. You can make a difference in this world and in this church. We need you, not just tomorrow. We need you today. We'll go back to Second Chronicles. When the king heard what was written, so in that sweeping changes... They found scripture. They, they went to the temple, and as they were cleaning the temple, like, what do you know? We found a copy of God's word. Not God's word as we have it, the 66 books of the Bible, but most likely the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. When the king heard what was written in the law, he tore his clothes in despair. It wrecked him. Most likely, Josiah had never really heard God's word. He knew the Lord. He had heard probably parts of God's word. But to actually have God's word read, and it wrecked him. Uh, have you ever been there where you're reading scripture and there's something in there that just speaks to you. And the Holy Spirit says, this is you. And sometimes it's convicting and says, this is you. Like, this is you. You've got a bad attitude. Or this is you. You've been doing wrong things. And you just, you just feel the weight of that sin. That's exactly what Josiah does. Which is contrary to the third lie that we have in our society. It's enough to read the Bible. You don't have to react to it. It's enough to read it. That's good. Good to read it. Good to listen to it. You can go to church, listen to a sermon. You can go to Sunday school and listen to a lesson on the Bible. That, that's it. You just need to listen. You just need to hear it. You just need to see it. You don't really need to react to it. But Josiah couldn't help but reacting to it. When the Bible was read, he reacted. But too often, we read the Bible because we know we're supposed to read the Bible, and it's kind of the checklist, and we mark it off. I read the Bible. But that's not what God wants us to do. He wants us to more than read the Bible or listen to the Bible. He wants us to react to the Bible. He wants us to allow his word to change us. 
because the Spirit of God will use the Word of God to make us more like the Son of God. That's the desire. That's the way it's supposed to work. But too often we seem to have bought the lie that it's enough to just read the Bible. That's why in James, James writes this, James chapter 1, verse 22, do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And so as King Josiah heard Scripture and recognized his own sin, he tore his clothes. Now, why did he do that? And you do realize that I, like, I brought this shirt so I wouldn't tear this shirt, right? It's like, um, you know, I, it might scar some kids for life if I tore a shirt I had on. Why did he tear that? Why did he tear his shirt? Was he like the Incredible Hulk? And like, he gets angry and, and rips his shirt? Or, or like the Hulkster that, like, showing off his muscles and so he rips his shirt? And, and by the way, um, for those that are like, oh, so now every time that I come to Scripture and I read something and I feel bad, I just like rip clothes. Um, so please hear me. If we were to tear our clothes every time we messed up, every time we needed to repent, some of you, <laughs> you'd be shopping at Walmart or whatever every day, right? You'd be going to the Goodwill to pick out more clothes because you'd be, you'd be going through a lot of clothes. Or, or maybe... Maybe if we took sin seriously to the point where, like, we understand the sorrow, because in their culture they would tear their clothes for a couple different reasons. One, when they understood their own sin. Two, when there was just something going on that caused them such great grief that one of the ways they dealt with their grief was to, to rend their clothes, to rip their clothes in mourning. But maybe if we understood sin and the weight of sin like we should, maybe instead of having to buy a bunch of new clothes all the time, maybe our behavior would start to change. Because the weight of that sorrow was so much that it would lead us to true repentance. Not just remorse for what we had done, but, but true repentance. And that's what we see with Josiah. He hears the Bible, and he reacts to it. He responds to it. The prophet Joel would say this because, like a lot of things, things can become kind of a, a habit. Well, this is what we're supposed to do. We, you know, we just know that about once a month, we're going we're gonna to rip our clothes as a way of kind of just saying, yeah, we messed up, I messed up, and... That was, that was not cool. And it just becomes kind of a, a show for us. And so God, through the prophet Joel, said the, these words, Rend your heart and not your garments. Because we can, we can tear our clothes, but the, the tearing of the clothes was really supposed to be a representation of what was going on on the inside, that that because I understand my sin and the sorrow of my sin, my heart is broken. And so I, I tear my clothes as a representation of what's happened on the inside, how my heart is broken because of my sin. And so Joel says, as God speaks through him, rend your heart and not your garments, because the one who sees our heart requires more than a spiritual ritual. And the command comes with a promise. Joel then said, Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and relents from sending calamity. <sighs> Joel got it. I mean, Josiah got it. He, he understood. Uh, he tore his clothes in, in reaction to, in response to God's word. And then that leads him 
to share God's word with his country people. And so we see these words as we continue. There the king read to them the entire book of the covenant that had been found in the Lord's temple. Now we're not sure exactly when it says here the book of the covenant. Is that referring to the Pentateuch? Again, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Or is that referring to a certain section in the book? Like we call the books of the Bible. And maybe they have a, a phrase for it. A certain section and I, I think that that could be the case I think it's possible that it was referring to the Shema which is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6 where we see these words hear O Israel and be careful to observe them in fact I'm gonna just put them up here on the screen hear O Israel the Lord our God the Lord is one and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. I really believe that this was at least a part of what Josiah had read that day because we'll see his response in just a bit. I think when Josiah had this read, he had already heard God's word and it caused him to react, but now he's taking it a step further. Because as we continue on, we see this. He pledged to obey the Lord by keeping all his commands, laws, and decrees with all his heart and soul. In this way, he confirmed all the terms of the covenant that were written in the scroll. Which takes us to the fourth lie. You don't have to be all in. You don't have to be all in. That, that's a lie that our society tells us. And way too often in church circles... That gets uh, passed on. That basically, it's good enough to just come whenever you feel like coming. You don't have to be all in. You don't have to give God everything. We're, we're going to be happy, and God's going to be happy with just whatever you want to give him. And, and you know what? If you want to worship God and you want to worship something else, you go ahead and do that. It's okay. American theology has followed American sociology. Here's what I mean by that. Just like in America, we are a giant melting pot of people, right? And that, that's a great thing about our nation. We, we see all kinds of, of, of different colors of people, different skin tones and things. Different backgrounds, some with European backgrounds, some with uh, African backgrounds, all kinds of different backgrounds all over the world. But we also see that come into our theology. You can worship God and claim Jesus, claim to be a Christian, but practice things from Hinduism. Or we call, we, and we look at things, well, well they're, they're, it's all one God. We're, we all serve one God. You know, we just look at him a little differently. And yet scripture says that's completely false. And so we get this idea that you can just have a little bit of Jesus and then you add a little bit of whatever else you want to have in. Whatever you want to give your life to. Whatever you want to put as the God of your life. You go ahead and do that. But Josiah knew that that was not the case. When we see Josiah at the age of 20. What does he do? He takes, he takes the idols and he smashes them. Right? Why? Because he knows the tendency of people. When it comes to idols, what do we like to do? You know what, with our sin, we're going to put this over here because we might want to come back to that later. But Josiah knew it had to be shattered. He had to take care of it. And so he didn't just like break it into pieces. He, he like completely, no, I can't do that. He, he completely shattered it because he knew how easy it is for people to go back to what they worshiped before. And to not be all in. And he knew, he knew that his heart, his life needed to be all in. 
and that he was going to lead a kingdom. He wanted them to be all in as well. Nothing else between them and the one Lord. One Lord. So my question to you today, are you all in? Are you all in? Or do you have an idol? We sang a song earlier. It's Coach Carter's favorite song. It says, I'm no longer a slave to fear. And then what does it say? I am a child of God. Here's what I want us to understand. God is not satisfied with joint custody. And yet some of us live as if he should be more than happy to share us with whoever we want to have over us, controlling our lives. And you think, well, it doesn't control my life. I didn't invite you to really ask yourself when it comes to making decisions. Do I make decisions based on God's word? Or do I make decisions based on what I want? Do I make decisions based on what God wants from my life? Or do I make decisions based on what I want for my life? And if you'll honestly answer those questions, you'll begin to see whether or not it's true if you bought the lie or not. You don't have to be all in. It's the lie that Satan wants us to believe. Because God has been very consistent from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And you shall love him with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. That sounds to me like God isn't satisfied with anything else but our everything. So in conclusion, I'd like to just ask you one more question. What lie have you been living? What lie have you been living? Your past determines your future. Young people can't make a difference. It's enough to read the Bible, not react to it. Or you don't have to be all in. What lie or lies are you living? I'm going to invite our praise team to make their way forward. As they're coming forward, again, just invite you to take some time to reflect on that. And then not just reflect on that, but respond to that and make the corrections that are needed. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your grace and your mercy. Lord, just like Josiah received your grace, just like the prophet Joel talked about if we'll just rend our hearts that we can find grace, you are a, a very gracious and merciful God. Lord, help us with these lies to understand that when we hear these lies, we see these lies. Lord, maybe we even we want to act on these lies that to, to be able to confront that with your truth and make the necessary adjustments. And so, Father, as we do that, as your spirit leads us, we trust that you'll be honored and glorified. And as we lift up our voices in praise to you, we pray that, Lord, that's exactly what will happen, that you'll be exalted. As we worship you, not just with our voices, with our lips, but with our hearts, that we would honor you with all that we have. I pray this in and for your name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand if you're able as we worship the Lord this morning.